at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Welcome to X5 Live for the week of the 11th of May. We've got David Reid here with us, uh, previous advisor of the year, AFA advisor of the year. Uh, he runs a, a practice called the Retirement Advice Centre, which specialises in people transitioning into retirement and uh, well-being during the retirement phase and transition into retirement. Uh, we're going to be covering some awesome things uh, today in terms of the things he does differently, um, what he's found that works in his business, and think a lot of things that we can take away and look at um, look at applying and doing differently in our business. Um, a big uh, big thank you to AIA, um, they're a big supporter of uh, XY Live, and without them we couldn't be doing this. Uh, Facebook, we've just gone to 400 people in the Facebook group, which is awesome. And um, for those who haven't been in there or haven't seen, there's a there's a great snapshot of the demographics and the breakdown of who's in the Facebook group. Um, so it's quite a diverse bunch. Uh, a lot of people are surprised that the um, that there's a lot of people that are a bit um, older than um, what may be the X and Y generation, which is fantastic. And I think there's uh, it just shows that everybody's getting value out of it, and it's not there's not an age definition of what we're doing here, which is awesome. Um, the, there's a Brisbane event that we've just lined up. So for anyone in Brisbane, um, towards the end of July, we're working out the details. We'll, we'll have an event um, happening around that time. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, the budget, uh, obviously generating a bit of interest. Um, I've got a multitude of videos from lots of other advisors that are doing great communications around their, uh, to their clients. Phil did a great job if anyone wants to copy and paste and um, just uh, hit your right on what he's done in terms of how he communicated um, to get Phil's fine. finance fixed, and <laughs> and um, and if you want um, if you want to hear some uh, some other stuff, there's also the Burst Boys, uh, Corey and, and James down in Melbourne. They do a great job as well. So if you're sort of umming and ahhing, you don't want to recreate the wheel, just copy what other guys are doing. Um, you don't mind, Phil? Will you? No, that's that's what XY Advisor is all about. Just copy and paste other people's stuff. <laughs> No point reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Dave, Dave is just having a few reservations about whether he wants to continue uh, with, the, with the program. <laughs> <for that. laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll just pass it over to you, David, to just give a general introduction about your business, um, who you work with, yeah. and uh, yeah, a bit about yourself. Yeah, by all means. So, um, look, thanks for having me, uh, guys. Um, I guess I started in the business about 2003, give or take. Uh, started Wealth Accumulators, the whole sort of 10 years either side of you and aging. Um, we're located in Sutherland, um, south of Sydney. And it was just a case, uh, I guess, around about 2010. We didn't have, in total honesty, a lot of pre or post retirees back then. There was a period of 90 days whereby um, financially our wealth accumulation targets have been met by a lot of our clients. And over a 90-day period, quite a number of them, even though financially had met their objectives, just didn't retire, even though they stated that was their objective. You know, we had, we had a pharmacist, for example, um, that owned a pharmacy and had a basically an eight-figure portfolio um, and quite modest means in terms of withdrawal rates of pension. Um, and, and look, he was working six and a half days a week, 14-hour days. Um, yet he still wouldn't retire. And on average, he'd get held up every 90 days because of the location of his pharmacy, um, which got us scratching our head. And, and certainly there was a concrete truck driver up in the central coast that probably was the most honest of everyone we've met. That he, His remark was, even though financially I've got enough money, I know that if I retire tomorrow, I'll just at one o'clock every day be sitting on the lounge with my wife. Um, and I'll just die of boredom watching days of our lives. Um, and then uh, probably the, the final one was a, a white collar professional owned, um, uh, I was sorry, managed a string of nursing homes. And I was asking because this really piqued our interest of just, well, if we're accumulating wealth for clients and doing our job in a traditional financial planning sense, yet they're not meeting their objective of their lifestyle of retiring, then what's 
uh, of what benefit are we bringing to the client at the end of the day and how do we know when the objective's met and if I'm coming back with other advisors and the admin team, what is the definition of success for us? Um, and, and so anecdotally, we were doing a lot of work with, with our existing clients and this, this fellow came in and subsequently, you know, I've taken him on today's show and, and he's been in magazines and so forth. But he made the point that prior to retirement, he just saw retirement as this list of pros and no cons. And he said, look, I've been working for, you know, 40 years. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll sleep in my first day. He said, so I slept in 11 o'clock. By one o'clock that afternoon, he said, I had this overwhelming feeling of guilt. Um, he said, I just walked around the home thinking, you lazy bastard for the next 18 months. And he said, I just couldn't shake it. Um, and he said, look, even in hindsight now, he believes there's more cons than pros in retirement. And yet, um, no, he didn't have anywhere to go to listen to that. He didn't seek other retirees or pre-retirees to get both sides of the equation. So his comment to us was, what I'd really like is a, is a centre that you could go and share your experiences with others and none of it, looking back, was relating to money. And that was kind of the trigger that, that, that then we just said, look, let's start. And I think it was around the same time I saw a, Steve, a really old Steve Jobs video of, on YouTube. You've got to start with a client and then a blank sheet of paper and work backwards. And that's exactly what we did. So we ended up working with retirement psychologists like the Canadian one, Barry LaValle, um, a, an institute of sports psychologist, Dr. Mike Martin, and just built everything around a values based what retirement looks like, pros, the cons, did a lot of work with um, and joined gerontology associations in the US and Australia and just worked backwards from there. So that's, I guess, in a holistic sense where we are today. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of the academics, we remodeled entirely our investment philosophy and how we do investments that, you know, we've taken from an industry association of retirement income specialists in the US. Um, and it literally was just starting with a blank sheet bit of paper and working backwards. Okay, great. So, the, so in terms of, that was sort of, you were having these issues with clients and you didn't feel like you were, um, I guess, meeting their needs. And that was the trigger for the exploration. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's, um, if we just add another digit or we change the digits, then, you know, what role am I actually playing to benefit the client and to have a fulfilling career as well and a fulfilling business that's going to grow? Um, there was just so much more to it. And I, even I didn't realise in 2010 that retirement was such an issue, such as, you know, the, and, and I know I've presented to the AFA, these sort of things, but you know, there's more male suicides at age 65 than teenage boys. Um, the level of divorce rates in that generation has gone from 13% to 28%. It's tripled in the UK and tripled in the US. It's the fastest growing demographic in divorce. So there's all of these issues such as, um, you know, the husband and wife will have a completely different view of what they expect retirement to be. Traditionally, and I'm speaking generally, um, the females see retirement as a time of um, volunteering, giving back to the community, spending time with family. The husband sees retirement as a time of travel, leisure, and quite often, if they haven't had that discussion and that pre-retirement planning of what retirement looks like, it's going to be in a polar opposite outcome once they actually meet. So there's a myriad of issues from you know just aging, um, and, and one of the best talks was in a, a, a financial services marketing journal, and I think it was 2007. Mm -hmm but they analysed ING in America did this. And it was, a, it was a fantastic hit, a TV program, of just people walking around with a number being their 401k balances, yeah? And it was a success. But what this marketing research indicated was baby boomers of today are after a lot more than you just maximising their potential wealth in their retirement savings. They actually want to know what longevity is going to hold for them going forward and how they should navigate as they age. So there's all of those sort of metrics putting us kind of, you know what, we're not doing this as good as we should be. Um, and in a financial sense, I know Michael Drew, for example, um, with Finzio wrote an article saying that if you retired at the peak of the GSC, then you lost the retirement date lottery and your chance of running out, let's call it a, just a traditional growth or balanced portfolio, your chance of running out of money before passing were 85%. So that's like me getting on a plane today in Sydney and a pilot saying, look, there's some storm headwinds coming up ahead. I've only got a 15% chance of landing this plane safely in Melbourne. 
I kind of think if the pilots were doing that, we wouldn't have an airplane industry today. Yeah, absolutely. The, I guess the, I'm really keen to delve into what your, I guess, um, what your learnings uh, uh, could, could sort of teach people dealing with younger people now and expectation management. But I guess to go, um, to delve into it a bit more, how do you execute so this is your philosophy now. It's, it's changed how your business is operated. How do you adopt it? And what were the things you do with clients? And what's your process look like now that what's changed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, quite happy to send through, like we do a blueprint of the journey. Um, we have an ongoing service program that, that, that's very designed around retirement um, specific issues, such as, I know, uh, I think, don't hold me to this, but I think it's Russell Research indicates your first year of post-retirement Whatever happens in your rate of return in that 12-month period will have a 14% impact upon the longevity of your money. Um, now, so we see our clients, for example, just on issues like that, it's purpose-built, no matter what you pay, what package you are on with us, we will see clients every six months over that 24-month period to take them in, in investing sense, in terms of their glide path to get them in and out of that retirement risk zone and then manage it going forward. There, there's every, when I say a blank sheet, I couldn't be more honest in terms of the experience when a client comes in, we have, you know, gas powered sort of just lift chairs that make it easy to get in and out. We have a higher board table than normal. Our text, we, you know, I mean, we, we chose a specific test that come from the American you know, Association of Gerontology that's easy to read as people age, etc. cetera. Um, and, and we just, that's in every document we have, it's always very specific, a certain size. Um, the words we use, it's just everything we do and how we communicate to clients has been started from the ground up. And I guess from a philosophy point of view, we'd very much take a credibility marketing piece of, you know, we published, co-authored co a book with Barry LaValle, the retirement psychologist that we give to clients. Um, we did a 50 tips because that's quite big and lengthy and it's got exercises that are great. But we did a 50 tips of once you're over 50, these are the sort of things you should be thinking about. And I guess to be totally trivial, like we, we think we should do some really good stuff and uh, around the money side. Yet at the end of every meeting, we'll have HIV questions that, you know, all of us will do. How have I done over the last 12 months? What can I improve? But what have, I valued, what have you valued the most out of us? Um, and certainly around the retirement piece, when we asked quite a volume of clients, they would come up with answers that we didn't expect, even though we thought the money side was cool. As an example, um, a lot of people would say, well, prior to retiring, that three to five years prior to retiring, you told us, look, psychologically, when you do retire, I'm on a fixed income and therefore I'm going to be more reticent to buy, you know, lump sum items. So we tell people typically whilst you're working, you know, get a new car or a fridge or the carpet, whatever's going to be a lump sum expense that it's going to last the next 10, 15 years comfortably for you, it's a good time to do it now. And we, there's little tidbits like that that, you know, our clients would say they were the biggest, you know, value adds that we provided, even though we think what we're doing with money and capital tracking and safe layers of income, we all think that's cool. It's all these other things around the periphery that they actually get the value add the most. So you never have to know until you actually go and ask, yeah. Yeah, the there's the area that I want to delve into. Shane Shane Hayes is, um, has just asked a question. I want to encourage everyone else to throw um, anything on the top of their mind in the, the uh, chat box there, and we'll definitely get to them. Um, what really, I guess, inspired me about what you're doing when I first came across your process was I really like the idea of um, your concept of what makes a great retirement. So in terms of what – so your clients that are having the best time in retirement – you went out and looked at what was, um, I guess, what are the components that go into that? And there's a few different areas in terms of what they need um, around themselves in terms of other people and yeah. other um, habits and um, hobbies, yeah. et cetera. Could, yeah. you, could you share a bit around that? Yeah, look, it's probably easiest. I mean, we talk about, you know, careers. Um, it may not be the career they're doing today. It may be a new hobby. So certainly the level of entrepreneurs over the age of 55 is so there's more entrepreneurs at 55 to 64 than there are at 25 to 34 just to give you an idea that people don't necessarily continue that lifelong you know teaching or engineers or whatever the case may be so we give them that spark and that that kind of uh, even as late as yesterday a lady was laid off you know as an office manager 
Um, but I gave the example whereby we had a tax solicitor that for the first 18 months really struggled with retirement and what he was going to do. And one of the coaching tools we use is to get people to think about, okay, it's your, it's your last day of high school. If you knew now, uh, if you knew then what you know now, what would you do in terms of hobbies, activities or a career? And this particular tax solicitor made the point of, I really enjoyed ancient history. So shortly after, he went enrolled at Macquarie University and he does one subject a semester and then in between semesters, he'll fly to wherever it is. There might be an archaeological dig or it might be a site and he gets that practical experience. But for him, it's an extremely fulfilling experience and it overcomes a lot of the hurdles when it comes to, you know what I mean, the boredom, the divorce issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, 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 it can be very scoping. It can't just, you know, that we warn people well in advance that um, psychologists have something called um, continuity theory, such as um, it's common for a pre-retiree um, to say, well, you know what, I've never had time to play golf, so I bought this $5,000 set of pinks, you know, ping sticks, and we're going to play golf five days a week. Um, the likelihood of that occurring just doesn't exist. The percentages are extremely low that if you're not already doing something prior to retirement, it is highly unlikely you're going to, to actually create a habit to do it. So some of the things you're seeing more and more are people will have um, a practice and we encourage a practice retirement. So you might have long service leave, six months off annually, whatever the case may be, and actually genuinely practice retirement, whatever that hobby or activity may be. Things in the UK that you've seen take off, uh, things like um, grey travel agents and what they're seeing, and this has become hugely popular, is, you know, the old, uh, you know, the, the high school, you go away for a gap year. People are seeing a grey gap year, but they're typically doing it in groups now, but they're just doing it in luxury. They're not actually doing backpacker style touring a country to do those sort of things. Um, so it's more about envisioning what you're going to be doing going forward and it just doesn't have to be age related. I mean, if we boil retirement down to what it was, it was, you know, Chancellor von Bismarck basically saying, look, um, it's a political move at the time. We're going to set age 65 that a government will pay you. Um, back in those days, longevity was at 63. So, you know, I mean, his maths was pretty good. But what it did do was set the world global golden benchmark that the government will pay you for being old and 65 became the defined benchmark as to when you become old. Two of those things are very arbitrary that go back now, you know, 100 odd years that really have little relevance to where we are today. Hmm. Well, I, I guess I just wanted to touch on, there's another, I'll let Phil jump in for questions after this one. Um, I sent you an email a while back and it was, it was a conundrum I had with a client that I was dealing with that was looking for work. They were over oh, yeah. 60 and, and I've yeah. had a couple of situations like that where just the challenge of getting re-employed at that age bracket and, and you said, you, how, how have you gone with that expiration in that space? Because I, I know you'd be dealing with it quite often. Yeah, look, it, it, it's becoming really common now and I don't know the statistics here, certainly in the US. They have what they call an association that's very, very politically powerful as well as wealthy. They've been going for a long time called AARP. Um, and they have a lot of TV ads around ageism and they promote it very, very strongly. And, excuse me, anecdotally, we are seeing, including yesterday with new clients, of there is just a definite ageism once I'm over 50. They just look at you differently once you go for another job. Um, so the sort of things we encourage, if... And this is the power, in my opinion, this is the power of, of financial planning as a profession. For them, it was a case of saying, you know what, your withdrawal rate, you've walked in the door and said, you want X, Y, Z from this amount of capital, that is easy. It's a 3% withdrawal rate. That's very, very comfortable. So for you to go back and be an office manager, no longer has to be an obligation for you to do it. I just have to explain that financially you should be very, very comfortable and confident that your money, pre-retirees only want to know three things. When can I retire? How long is my money going to last? Um, and how much can I take each week? That's it. So if we can give them confidence for those three things on the financial sense, we then give them the ability to say, well, if you were back at high school, what would you like to do? Whether it's a career, whether it's a new entrepreneur activity, um, and generally speaking, don't get me wrong, that takes time to build that financial confidence, but that's our role. Um, the sort of things that we're endeavouring to do 
I guess is more the whole gig economy somewhat. Um, and we've been working a little with, uh, you know, trying to bounce ideas off uh, the guys at Stone and Chalk just in terms of how could we build a platform around um, utilising, it's, it's the, 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 the world-leading gerontologist, his name's Ken Dietwald in my opinion anyway, he calls it the silver tsunami. Um, and we expect, you know, engineers and, um, you know, academics and doctors, once they reach, you know, 65, 67, their level of giving back to society might be driving, you know, meals on wheel bus or volunteering, you know, to turn a stop-go sign, the pedestrian. So we have all of this wealth of experience, knowledge, education, wisdom that just gets kicked to the curb. Yet, you know, anecdotally, we, we speak to them and they say, look, financially, we would like some money for what we do, but it's what the business could afford um, and to give us value on the tools that we've provided. But we're not after a two hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars dollars $400,000 job anymore. We just want to give back and utilise the tools that we already have. So, look, it's a massive project. It's even bigger than I originally thought. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it, it's something that I'm passionate about. It's just like anything with technology, it's, it's a long, drawn-out project in, in total. Yeah, David, the thing, the thing I love about this interview um, is that you can tell you are just all in on this retiree space and, and helping retirees transition from work to retirement. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's so good because, you know, as, as planners, as business owners, we're told, yeah, you know, you should niche, you should really think about it. And you can just tell that uh, once you're all in, you can just see the passion uh, that obviously would come through to clients, um, that you, you're obviously passionate about the the stage of life that they're in, um, which is great. My, my first question is, um, since doing uh, the reti- – uh, sorry, what, what's, the, what's the centre called? The Retirement Advice Centre, just to keep it Retirement sentence. Advice Centre. Since, since building that, um, more, have you changed the way you're charging fees within your business? Yeah, obviously, you know, um, at, a, at a certain point, you know, almost all clients will go into pension phase. Um, so we, we did the modelling on, you know, percentage-based FUM, etc. I've never been a huge fan of that. It's just a personal view. Um, so we just simply, the day we did it, we just went to a set flat fee. We have two models, one being, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to see clients on a certain um, level of periodicity, periodicity. Therefore, we're going to charge them X, Y, Z. Um, and then fixed fee if they've got a certain amount of either needs, complexity and or, you know, um, risk associated with their portfolio and structures. So there's really only two fees. Um, We charge one fee as an SOA. We don't charge implementation. You're either monthly on board, you are or you're not. But then it's just purely a case of, you know, whether you take money out, whether you add money in, we can model our business um, without sort of care of where their money is, and we can sort of say, we'll put it here. The new super changes on the 1.6, those sort of issues, you know, mm. it doesn't bother us because we've got a fixed flat fee. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, my next question is, um, you said you kind of redesign the whole way you do your business. Um, yeah. you know, talking to other advisors who are thinking about, you know, how do we focus purely on the client experience and, and their needs? Um, what would your recommendations for an advice business who's kind of starting to think about, you know, let's just tear everything up and build it yeah. from scratch? I'd highly recommend it, first of all. That's the total truth. Um, I think niche has been one of the key drivers, no matter what our end up story was. I think focusing on a niche um, within the first 12 months, I would suggest our referrals, for example, um, were 10 times multiple to the 12 months prior. Um, and the main reason is they actually understand what we do. If we ask 10 people walking down the street outside my office, what a financial planner did, I'm tipping we're probably gonna get eight different answers. Um, knowing exactly what we do, who we want as a client, make that very, very clear just through our marketing collateral and and the discussions we have gives the propensity to refer so much more power. Um, So doing, you know, starting from scratch, niching on, I'm a big fan of, um, but also looking external to the the financial planning profession. Uh, I honestly think, um, I think the fat duck's a good example whereby I'm kind of annoyed and I bought his thick book just recently that, you know, as a profession, we have to know everything about, you know, the, the, the client's financial situations, their dreams for the future, everything about the family. And quite often you're going to learn a lot more about their history and childhood and beliefs 
yet here we are, we've got a chef that um, through his client experience has brought, you know, tribal features such as doing the jigsaw as you walk in. He rings you up and builds the anticipation of well, where did you go on holidays? We're going to build a menu around that experience to take you back in memories. And then just the whole ongoing sort of few hours that you're there eating a meal is all about that real deep knowledge of the client and building a service experience around that. And I kind of, yeah, I'm jealous. I kind of think, wow, we, we really, as a profession, should be making that experience of seeing an advisor so much more special. If a cook can do it, surely we can do it. I, I, I kind of, and we know a lot more than they do. So I kind of think, well, it's exciting in terms of the technology and tools and everything else, but you've got to look outside to get that knowledge. And I know we're going to touch on South by Southwest, but that's the sort of thing where you kind of go, look, it's not the tools per se, it's the mindset of what these entrepreneurs have nothing to do with our business, sure, but are bringing to the client experience, how you deliver the product or service. Um, this, it, it's a fantastic opportunity to redesign what we're doing today, for sure. And, and you did touch on that, South by Southwest, as, um, you know, winning the, the award with AFA that sent you over to South by Southwest. What, what are kind of your key takeaways from that trip? Yeah, look, I, I liked it so much the first time that I went back again this year, just off my own bat. Um, last year was very, very different than this year. Last year, certainly there was a lot about, and both years have been a lot about storytelling. So, you know, you'll have film writers and authors and, the, and, and even how to present in public that are going to talk about the hero's journey and how you weave a storyline and, and I know Paul Carney went last year and he saw the you know one of the narrators for Disney and every movie they do is is built a certain way um, and then you go into sport and psychology and virtual reality how it's used in sport and potentially film and even travel and things like that this year was a little bit different um, there were there were three sessions for the first time just on financial technology um, and I really liked it. I, I, I was encouraged in terms of the way that they're thinking around financial technology. Um, there was one lady from Hong Kong who spoke about currently robo advice is uh, you walk in the door, you do a risk pro, sorry, you walk into your computer, you do a risk profile, set and forget, and you get a bunch of ETFs and away you go. She said, look, A, it's simplistic and B, it's kind of dumb in her view. She said, quite correctly, that um, her business, keep in mind, is two-thirds now developers, even though, you know, it's a financial planning company. She said the number one determinant of your outcome is your investor behaviour. So we have the tools available. You've just got to piece it together in terms of what does this person do when markets are good? What does this person do when markets are bad? We should be predicting a person's behaviour before they actually invest and then make changes along that journey with the portfolio based upon their investor behavioural traits. And I guess in my mind, I was look, uh, thinking back to example, I know Martin Seligman, the, let's call him the godfather of positive psychology. If you go and see one of you know his psychologists today, before you walk in the door, they're doing a, a word jumble on your social media to get an idea of the key, you know, your behaviours and the psychology of you before you actually walk in the door. They're getting a taste of what you are. And this lady was very, you know, I thought really insightful in terms of, well, if your behaviour is your number one determinant, let's really know your behaviour before we put together a portfolio. Um, there, was another, there was another panel just on the similar subject, jointly Goldman Sachs with Accenture. And the thing I really like that's probably more down the XY space to a degree is... Um, you know, their view is technology and particularly artificial intelligence that I'm referring to will give us a much deeper understanding of clients going forward. And it'll give, it wasn't about advice, but it'd give intermediaries many more options to give salient advice for those clients. And he made the point that he asked this 25 year old from Accenture, you know, tell us about your experience with money. And off the cuff, this young guy's kind of gone, well, look, every Sunday for half an hour a weekend, I have to do adult work. I've got to pay bills. I've got to transfer money. He said, I should be out dining, traveling. I don't want to care about money. It should be everything else in my life, like my TV, my car. Once it's set up and set up for my circumstances, it's set and forget. So if my values, and you're going to change my habits to meet my destiny of you know, buying a car, buying a home, et cetera, in financial terms, maybe I've got a limit that has an artificial intelligence 
on my card that if I shop at Coles and I spend $400 this week, then either it comes up and says, well, you're going to breach this so you won't be able to buy the car, or it just says, no, you can't do it this week because I put in the setting. And they're the sort of things that they're saying in the AI of the future will be influencing my daily habits to reach the goals that I want to reach. And I kind of go, look, it, it makes perfect sense to me. And it's not as far as always we think. So it's really enlightening in terms of where yeah. all this is going. And so you, you talked a lot about tech and your, your business is highly focused yeah. around, you know, pre-retiree, retirees. What type of tech yeah. um, do you use in your business? And, and have you found some resistance with some of your client base? Yeah, so, I mean, even starting on, and, and I spoke just recently to a, a group of mortgage brokers, they're worried about legislation, etc. And kind of the silver lining, one of the silver linings we had with, um, I think it was back in FOFA days whereby, you know, we've got to do the FTSs, opt-ins and this, that and the other. I mean, we built, a, we use SharePoint for our intranet and we build client-specific uh, sites that they can access and all the documents are essentially there to make sure that all our clients can get access to them. Uh, we will give them a free mini iPad. It costs, you know, 250, 300 bucks. Um, and we set up all the passwords. We instruct them. It's got a user manual. We'll go through everything they need to be able to use that uh, iPad. Probably in terms of, um, we, we, we now because the iPads are certainly, you know, in almost every household, we're moving on. Um, some of the things that we're, we're likely to introduce, I've got one over my shoulder here, is an Amazon um, Echo. Um, just this week, they've just released uh, a, uh, a video screen, so thereby, not only can they, you know, clients use that for, uh, and I'll give you an example whereby the biggest blogger in the US um, suffers from, or the biggest blogger on the issue of dementia um, um, recommends Amazon Echo, for example, to his readers. And the reason for that is they might have a carer and they'll say, well, what time is it? Or what day is it? Every couple of hours, which is very, very fatiguing. Um, yet if you've got an artificial intelligent device like Echo, you can sort of ask it as many times as you like. Or alternatively, you can say, if you've got an Amazon account and if it's some others connected, you can get it to read you a book. What's the weather? How long is it going to take me to get here from there? Tell me a recipe that I've got to type out or read out in terms of how to do poached eggs, whatever the case might be. So they're tools in terms of, and our intent now that they're bringing out a video screen one is to replace our iPad with that so as to make a voice assisted technology basically build and run their household and their day-to-day -day lifestyle over time. And plus they'll be able to be connected with the office. Just on a business side, and I was one of the guys at the AFA uh, in Canberra made this point and, and was, you come back with ideas from conferences sometimes and some float, some don't. But probably this has been the biggest uh, explosion we've had that's been embraced within the office. It's just been the app Slack. Um, it, it, it has totally replaced email within our office. Our office communication advisors are out. After hours, admin will get on, jump things in terms of notes, etc. what's happening here, there, or everywhere. Um, we've used the Hey Taco uh, integration with Slack in terms of rewarding you know, staff for good initiatives, client wins, different channels on power planning, mortgages, whatever the case might be. So, um, yeah... I'm a big fan and, and certainly in social media use, you know, the pre-retirees are now one of the fastest or the fastest growing demographic. Um, it's just how we use it and making it a little bit more seamless and a benefit for everyone. Yeah, well, the, I think, um, yeah, it's great that you're you, able to use that, especially with your demographic. And I think um, a lot of people have had experiences sort of it can be a bit hit or miss depending on, um, on the person you're dealing with and the couple or... Yeah. Um, on their aptitude around it. Shane has just got a good question. I know you've, you've niched um, with where you're targeting. Yeah. Um, have you held on to some younger clients and how has your, I guess, conversation changed? Or if you haven't, how, what would you advise people dealing with a 35 to 40 year old in terms of your experience now after you've, you've seen um, how you've evolved? Yeah. Um, so answer the first one. Yes, we do. And, and, and we continue to get um, clients having the comment, you know, the parents having the comment, look, I know it's not your core business, but would you speak to our kids? Rah, rah, rah. And typically I may sit in the first meeting and then one of the younger advisors in the office will take over the relationship and away it goes. Um, look, I, 
intergenerational wealth planning, in my view, um, is extremely important. We use it, you know, in every SOI we do. But the concept, and it's just my belief, and I, it's right or wrong, it's just, you know, if, if I'm talking, Adrian, to your parents, and they're going to leave wealth, and I'm going to make some numbers up here, but let's say it's $600,000 wealth, and you typically have a Sydney mortgage that's between six hundred dollars and $800,000, um, I'm not really about to tell you, Adrian, that, you know, we should be managing a portfolio when you've got a mortgage to pay off, for example, you get my drift. Um, so I don't know if it's the, you know, pathway to riches in terms of financial advice that, you know, we're going to have a connection, but I'm not going to harass you, Adrian, sort of every six months about, you know, this family that goes on and on and on. Um, so, yeah, I, I do have my reservations that we're everything to everyone. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we, we still have those wealth accumulators. Um, I'll go to the first meeting, but then the younger advisors will take over on an ongoing basis. What was the second question in terms of the 35 to 45? Oh, just, I guess in terms of how, um, what you've learned around your target demographic, how that's then, um, what have you changed in how you treat? So I guess a lot of us do deal with younger, younger generation. Yeah. How yeah. would you suggest an adjustment in like, what are the things that we could do that would make it? transition into that space a lot better. Yeah. Look, um, you know, when I look back and, and I often sort of review every January sort of that path, um, I look at things like core data's insights, et cetera, of just what clients really, really want, um, you know, and minimising tax consistently comes through as one of those big issues and big drivers for advice. Where money in motion events occur, is it the divorce? I know Michael Kitsis wrote, you know, the last seven days, just about that certified divorce financial advisor market. I'm kind of going, man, that, that's, that looks, you know, a real opportunity. Um, wherever there's money in motion events occurring, saying, and boiling it down in terms of what questions are they asking and where can I help? My personal opinion is, you know, the, the Wayne Gretzky theory of, you, you know, you skate to where the puck's going. It's not just answering, well, how do I minimise tax? But what questions and where would technology be in the next 10 years that I can build a business that's going to match that pathway? Um, so obviously, like, technology, ease of use, lower interruption in their day-to-day -day lives. And to use that Accenture guys sort of analogy, how can I make their life simpler, that it's more set and forget? And obviously cash flow, things like that, that's going to be an integral part for a 35 to 40-year-old. And then basically mapping it in so, okay, minimise tax, you super, et cetera, et cetera, and opportunities along the way. Um, but it's really not taking – looking back for us, it wasn't just taking the insights and academic research. It was then saying, just go and ask. And, that, and by – the law of numbers, you're going to get it right once you ask enough people. That's just my opinion. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we've got a, another question. We're going to go through audience questions because we've got plenty of them. Dylan asked, um, has a change in your approach within your business uh, made the work more enjoyable? Uh, and do you think it's refreshing and adds longevity to your own financial planning career after so many years being in, being an advisor? Yeah, look, good question. Um, Look, I, I think any time you specialise, there will be unintended consequences. Um, and I'll give you a couple. One is that level of divorce thing that I touched upon before is, is no joke. Um, we are having, now that, you know, we're dealing with those 55 to 65 year olds more and more commonly, that divorce can have a very significant issue. And we've probably got three within our business right now. Um, how do we handle that from an ethical basis? Mm. How do we split advice? Should, who do we refer to? Should we refer to? How do you pick which client to, you know, advise upon, etc.? cetera? Um, that's a significant issue, uh, just as an example, and we didn't expect it. Who knew? Um, the second is hiring staff. Um, for the market we are, um, for our value proposition particularly, we have a, you know, a very, a very strong ongoing relationship. So that servicing advisor, should have strong empathetic traits you know um, it's not my skill to be totally truthful of sitting down you know four years after first meeting and if we're doing our job correctly we're going to be certainly talking about the family what, you know what travel have we got on what's the dogs up to etc cetera, etc cetera. so you want that style of advisor that's highly empathetic and quite happy to have a coffee and a chat They'll touch upon their advice, everything's going to plan, etc. But then it might be another hour just talking about 
family things and just general chit chat. So there are those unintended consequences that fall out of it. Um, so you kind of have to be yeah, a little bit agile in terms of how you build your business going forward. That's a great insight. I, I, um, I've got another good one from Dylan. He's, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's thrown out the goals versus values piece. So, and you've sort of touched on that in terms of the way you've adjusted in terms of the retirement space. Yeah. Um, and also looking at how people, you're mentioning how people um, trying to forecast how people will react to markets as well and incorporating that. So I think that plays into it. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a hard one because as advisors, we always want to get very static around, okay, we've got a really clear fixed objective. Um, yeah. And I guess a lot of models out there have struggled to adapt to a more dynamic approach in terms of um, yeah. adjusting around that. Yeah. What are your thoughts around that? Do you think it yeah. has, like they have to be in sync and yeah, look, um, so I worked with, and it's on my board of advice for the practice, this Dr. Martin from AIS and uh, Australian Institute of Sport and Camera. Um, he's now at Homebush at New South Wales, and, but a lot of Olympic athletes work around a values based uh, methodology. And it's fairly modern, even for you know, sports psychology of, I'm not going to get up today and do my personal best. You know, I just can't do that every day. So I might be at a lower percentage, but I'm still living the values of a healthy lifestyle, training, and away I go. So we've worked with him a lot in terms of, for example, he's highly critical of our fact finds, and this is an industry-wide issue, such as, um, you know, you turn to page two of most fact finds and they just talk about goals and objectives. But, and, and I'll give you an example, if I'm, if I'm a personal trainer and where our goal is for argument's sake to lose weight, then if it doesn't happen, um, then I'm going to be critical and embarrassed by myself because I'm not doing what I thought and I probably don't want to see you. But alternatively, it doesn't happen, I'm going to blame you. What the hell, you're not doing your job, yeah? Um, alternatively, if I do achieve it, I'm then going to come to you and say, what's next? And you've got to come up with the goods each and every time. So whereas if we reframe that to be values, such as a healthy lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera, the best way is to give you a story. I met with a client um, to about 2012. It was a really good portfolio, excellent outcome. I'm sitting there. Their goal was to travel to France um, and spend about $25,000 to do it. And I'm looking at the rate of return, I'm looking at all the maths and I'm kind of going, yeah, I'm really happy with this. Yet the client was still a little uptight and I didn't quite get the gel of why, why there was some concern. And they just made the comment, oh, look, the portfolio has gone well, but considering you know, where we are, we still don't think we've hit the numbers we want to spend that sort of money. And I spoke to Dr. Martin after and I said, how would I better handle that? He said, yeah, 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 it's still to do with goals. You're talking about France and 25 grand. Their values are to go somewhere they haven't been before, meet new people, see new things, reframe the discussion to live their values, not their goals. Mm -hmm. I called them back in and we went over it and said, well, okay, we're not happy to spend 25 grand, but what if we spend five grand, go to Adelaide, you haven't been there, you're going to go to the wineries, you're going to do X, Y, Z, and it's still living the values that you want to do, and we'll just review your portfolio on an ongoing basis to make sure we get that buffer. We'll still get there in the end. It's just a matter of reframing the goals from values discussion, and you just see their shoulders just relax, to be totally truthful. Um, they're the sort of things. We go on for this one for hours, but, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a major issue, to be totally honest. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Just a last audience question, um, just about using Slack. You said you love using Slack uh, yeah. within your business. Have you, um, Benjamin Martian just said, do you think you'd use Slack with clients and so clients can then communicate with each other at all? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I'm a big fan and it's something I'm still working on building in the tribe. Um, uh, we have a... I know I was on the road shows, but we have a champagne board in our office. So at our 90-day meeting, we have a champagne with clients, the retirement thing, et cetera, et cetera. And we just put a little, you know, uh, name tag underneath, et cetera, the date they retired. And there's, you know, three boards within the office, et cetera. And it's a conversation piece as well. Um, <laughs> one of the advisors has brought up this client you know, client channel and, and they can speak. Um, at this stage, the only sort of negatives in our discussion within the office were, what if I say the wrong thing in the wrong channel? Um, not that I expect it to happen, but that's the major concern. I guess what I'm very, very keen on, though, is the release from Amazon 
of just a screen that they can talk to us. And it's just like Slack. It's just an app. It's free. They can have a conversation. They can text message it through. And if all the advisors have a screen that's just sitting there that is artificial intelligence driven in a way, but they can have a chat and call in vice versa. I kind of, that's where my head's at at the moment. I'm not saying it can't work. And I think it'd be a great avenue to do it um, because it's, yeah, everyone's got a phone. Um, yeah, so I'm in two minds with that, to be honest. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. I mean, I guess a solution could be you could just have a separate uh, Slack group or... Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah sorry. It isn't um, your business group, um, but all yeah, your advisors and your staff... And, look, and, and, and whilst we're on um, Slack and, 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 and Hey Taco, it's like a fantastic integration. We have a, a spinning wheel, if you will. So once you... You can cash in your tacos within the office once you get to certain levels. But we've also created a like the old chocolate where with different rewards up to twenty dollars, whereby those each week that give out the most tacos, you know, or someone in the office can spin it, they get an award, and it just it's creating a bit of a well, we're trying to you know encourage the whole teamwork sort of concept. Um, but the guys from Hey Taco have emailed through. They got I think don't quote me on it, but they got hundreds of thousands of users if not more, yet, you know, they, they, they mailed to us from the US a uh, handwritten card saying, you guys are our first financial planning or financial services company to use us in the world, and you're the fourth company in Australia to even use us, and here's a whole bunch of taco um, stickers. You know what I mean? You just think, like, it, it, it's a mass-produced product that they are doing custom individual service, and there's something in that. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's good because uh, doing something that isn't scalable um, obviously shows the clients how much you appreciate them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. All right, we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up. So thank you everyone who's watched. Uh, we're gonna take the questions into the Facebook group. So make sure if you are watching and you're not in the Facebook group, have a look at yourself in a mirror and join the group. So just my three takeouts actually um, from our discussion was. Um, being solely focused on the client's needs. And, and David, I think you're doing that fantastically, just going, okay, it's not just about managing money at all. It's just about how, what are the client's questions, what are their needs, and just being solely focused on that. Um, and also on the back of that, you, you can't um, build a focused client experience without highly niching your business, uh, something I know I need to be working on a bit better uh, within my business. Um, and also just kind of that last tidbit was, um, you know, delivering great client experiences that may not be scalable. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you, David, for sharing all your experience and being willing to kind of open up to the group and we'll see everyone in the Facebook group. Have a good week.